Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar organized by School Education Gateway. My name is Marta and I'm pleased to host this event today. Uh, just a practical information for the audience, the webinar is recorded and the recording might be used for dissemination purposes. And if you have questions, please post them in the chat and we will have a Q&A session at the end. Today's focus is improving men mental well-being of teenagers with a whole school, school community approach. And I'm very happy to introduce our speakers today. Carlotta Las Hayas holds a PhD in psychology and she's a senior researcher in the field of health psychology and the principal investigator of the Hapright project. And Matt Marie uh, Ledertug has 20 years of experience within the field of education and she's currently managing the Danish pilot side of the Upright research project. Upright is an innovation and research project founded by Horizon 2020 program of the European Union, and it aims to promote mental well-being and prevent mental disorders by improving resilience skills in young people aged 12, 14. But without further delay, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Carlotta and Matt Marie. Okay, thank you very much. I will start sharing my screen. And please let me know if you see my screen as in presenter mode. Yes, we do. Just one second. OK, yes. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. OK, first, then um, I would like to say good afternoon to everyone and thank you for attending this webinar on the whole school approach to promote adolescent mental health. I, we would also like to thank the School Education Gateway platform for inviting us to participate in this webinar. This webinar is co-presented by my colleague Mete from the Aarhus University and me, Carlota Lasayas, from the Institute for Health Service Research, Kronigune, in the Basque Country, Spain. Without further ado, let's just start with the presentation. As you know, adolescence is the stage of development that occurs between the ages of 10 and 19 years old. It is characterized by many biological, psychological and social changes. And during adolescence, 50% of mental disorders start. And it is also the time when the acquisition of essential skills for life and for well-being will also happen. Mental health and well-being during adolescence are strongly influenced by life experiences and relationships. Factors that help young people adapt to new situations and cope with stressful life events include feeling connected to family, receiving unconditional support at least by one adult, and having peer support. But there are also risk factors that can happen to adolescents, like experiences of bullying, lack of peer acceptance and lack of support from parents and teachers. Frequent and sustained stress in adolescence leads to emotional and psychological pain, which can turn in several difficult um, problems associated with health. Resilience can be a key resource to facilitate positive adaptation to so many changes and related problems. Resilience, the definition, refers to the ability of an individual or community to cope with, adapt to, and recover quickly from stress and shocks caused by adversity. Resilience was initially thought to be a fixed trait of some invincible people, those who thrive despite hardship in very difficult contexts. However, we now know that resilience is not a fixed trait, but a set of skills that can be learned. Innate characteristics do play a role, but resilience is something that can be promoted and developed through the provision of support and opportunities for growth. We also know that resilience is fostered by, by interaction with the environment, by receiving support from friends, from family, from teachers, from the whole school community, from the community and, and the school community is also a, a source of support. So psychoeducational programs that take place in the school are a great source of resilience too. Resilience is a key component of mental well-being. 
Having good mental well-being is not just the mere absence of illness. Well-being is defined by the World Health Organization as a state in which each individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and are able to make a contribution to his or her community. Resilience is a, a, a really important point to facilitate positive adaptation and in times of changes and, rela and related problems. Our level of well-being moves along a continuum from low to high, depending on our personality, where we are and what happens to us. It is important to focus on resilience because resilience can, can help us move more quickly and effectively towards higher levels of well-being when things get difficult. So promoting resilience during the adolescent years is key to contributing to positive mental well-being and successful maturational development in adulthood. Resilience and well-being are important because they help prevent the onset of mental health problems and reduce their severity. To focus on resilience and well-being is to focus on providing relevant skills to cope with life's problems and difficulties, maintaining positive inter interpersonal relationships relationships and set realistic goals, all of which impact on adolescents' ability to act and contribute meaningfully in everyday life. And why are schools a good setting for promoting resilience and well-being? There are many reasons why schools are an optimal place, and I will just um, illustrate some of them. First, as you all know, schools are a comprehensive have a comprehensive educational role. So schools are not only places to teach on academic subjects, but instead this, they have this holistic aim of, of educating a, 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 in psychological health, in physical health and in social health. As, when schools are perceived as a safe place, the, even the students and the teachers will behave better in return. They will have a better behavior and better marks. So uh, schools that promote resilience and well-being, generally they are uh, perceived as, as, as a safe place. Uh, schools are also places where we have access to large numbers of young people. And as we have said, uh, these young people are in, a, are in a very sensitive time, age, for intervention. So it is good to intervene to this large number of people when they are this this young. These people also spend a lot of time in a school which give us a lot of opportunities to make an influence on them. So these, uh, the students are um, all the time in the school and teachers as well. So this provides the opportunity for early detection of at-risk adolescents so the school community can take action and address the situation properly. For those vulnerable children that they don't have a, a safe place at home, school can be that safe place, can be a supportive and resilient place for these children. The school is also a very complex setting where, where a lot of things happens. They, they, they have uh, relationships with the with the teachers, with the classmates, they have conflicts, they have um, to do homework. So it is a great place to practice resilience skills. So it is a great place to teach resilience skills and practice resilience skills. And it is a great time to um, promote resilience and train uh, resilience on them because um, they will start early learning healthy skills and protective factors. And now let's examine the, the, the whole school approach to promote well-being and resilience. So what is a whole school approach? It is an ecological way of viewing a school. So it is quite a wide concept and um, the school is seen as an open learning hub which provides supports to its neighborhood and also receives support from the community. 
all members of the school community. So we are talking about the school leaders, middle management, teaching and non-teaching staff, students, learners, parents and families have a responsibility and they feel responsible and play an active role in fostering well-being and resilience. And in this whole school approach, the needs of everyone are addressed and, and evaluated because it is quite a complicated, it's quite a um, wide uh, approach. So uh, the, everyone should be uh, taken into account and should be included. So their needs are very important to be addressed. So let's start uh, the, and examine the role of each of the, of the agents that take part in a whole school approach. First is school governance. This is a very important part of the whole school approach. We need competent and effective school leadership in order to implement this type of approach. It is necessary to, pro pro to promote positive school culture, teamwork and collaborative practices within the school community. Regarding children, students, the whole school approach is child-centered. So it is imperative to ensure that all children and young people have equal opportunities in a school to access mental well-being resources and quality education. Regarding the school staff, there should be a commitment to investing in the ongoing professional development of school principals, teachers and other school staff, focusing on awareness of the importance of mental well-being to adolescent health and the competencies and skills needed to promote it. Regarding parents and families, these, these agents are sometimes very difficult to engage, but it, they are a key agent in a whole school approach. And parents and families should, um, should be aware that educating in well-being and resilience is a shared responsibility between them and the school. So they need to be connected with the school, attend the school and participate. The whole school community also involves external local services like youth services, community care workers, psychologists, counselors, local authorities, NGOs, parents and families that all need to promote resilience and well-being. The school must provide a caring and a stimulating and supportive learning environments so that all learners feel safe, nurtured and included. This should be the culture of the school. Developing this type of collaboration, as you can see, takes time and requires institutional, financial, human resources and a change of approach and mindset. It requires individuals to have both the capacity and the ability to implement innovative approaches to working in interdisciplinary settings. It also requires more time and space for dialogue and cooperation, more pupil participation and greater involvement of parents and families. So, um, I hope that with this explanation we have cleared that a whole school approach is a wide um, system of implementing um, one uh, intervention and it takes the whole school. So an inter what is not a whole school approach? A whole school approach, it is not a whole school approach when only one part of the school community is working towards a goal. For example, when only one teacher or is teaching mental health in a, in a classroom. That would not be a whole school approach. I wanted to share with you this, this image from the UNESCO that I thought that it was very um, self-explanatory of a whole school approach trying to um, foster sustainable development in a school. So as you can see, um, all physical, human and governance resources are made av available for the same purpose, that is sustainability. And as it says on the top, it says sustainability is not just something to learn, it is something to live. So it takes life. The, the, in the case of a well-being program, it would be 
to making real, very real, the importance of well-being in a school. So in this example, we see that in classrooms, um, mainstream education would be interspersed with learning about sustainability. We can see that the school buildings and the infrastructure take into account inclusiveness and respect for the environment because the focus is sustainable development and decisions about sustainability are made jointly, as you can see in the school hall, listening to everyone's voices. There are practical collective activities that promote sustainability, as you can see in this garden in the back, and community resources such as the municipal theatre company that you could see on the top right of the, of the picture, come to the school and play and convey the message of the importance of sustainability. So as you can see, a whole school approach takes the entire school physically and, and, the, and the human resources and all the politics and they align them to get one aim. So now let's uh, jump and present the Upright project. That is an example of a resilience-based intervention using a whole school approach. Some basic information about the Upright project. The full title is Universal Preventive Resilience Intervention Globally Implemented in Schools to Improve and Promote Mental Health for Teenagers. This research is funded by the Horizon 2020 program. It started in January 2028 and will end this December 2021. The coordinator is the Institute for Health Services Research, Kronigune, where I work. And the objective of the Upright project is to promote mental well-being and prevent mental disorders in adolescents between 12 and 14 years old through the creation and implementation of a psychoeducational resilience intervention in schools. The intervention takes a whole school approach involving adolescents, their families and the whole school community. In order to test for the effectiveness of this intervention, we have designed a controlled, randomized, longitudinal, multi-center trial that is running in five European countries, Spain, Italy, Poland, Denmark and Iceland. So this is uh, the Upright Consortium. We are many members from these different countries. And I would like to show you the overview of the research project. It started in 2018. It finished by the end of 2021. And as you can see in the red bar, uh, we are almost reaching the end. The, the way that we started, we started co-designing the intervention. So in order to co-design the intervention, we use co-creation methods. We involved participants, future users of the intervention to help us create the intervention and validate it in their local context. context. So this intervention should be uh, sensitive to the specificities of each region. So we needed to see that if the manual, the, the program, uh, was uh, uh, was adapted to the reality of each place. Once we had the intervention um, approved and validated, we started implementing the intervention in the schools. And at the same time, we are starting evaluating the intervention using quantitative, qualitative and, and other techniques. So by the end of uh, this year, uh, we will have the last and final version of the of the upright program for public release and you will be able to download it for free in the web page of the of the project. So now let's explain to you very briefly how we did the how we created the manual and the intervention. So for the co-creation of the program, we did um, a literature review. And um, we also review other programs that already existed. And we also uh, had the feedback from the international experts that uh, are part of the upright team. And uh, for the co-creation, 
um, we did surveys and we did working groups using different techniques of uh, the co-creation methodology. Upright takes a whole school approach because it requires the collaboration of all staff, teachers, families and students to integrate the development of the of resilience skills into daily relationships. We know that for the program to be effective, we we have to target the the agents that surround the adolescent population. So we have to target the faculty members, the education center, the community and the and the families. In fact, it is the teachers themselves who offer the resilience training to adolescents. The expected benefits of the intervention are the improvement of mental well-being, the prevention of mental disorders, and the creation of a culture of mental well-being in the adolescent's immediate environment. In Upright, every member of the educational community has an essential role. First, teachers learn the program, live, live it and teach it to the students. The school management team implements the program with a whole school approach and creates an educational climate that promotes resilience based on fostering a sense of belonging, positive relationships, participation in the decision making process and social inclusion. Other community partners and actors come to the school to promote resilience and families receive the intervention and have the role of educating and modeling resilient behaviors for their children. The implementation and evaluation of the intervention is ongoing at the moment. As I said, this is a randomized controlled trial uh, and has been implemented in 39 schools from five European countries and the procedure that we follow was we, we gathered these 39 schools and we randomized them. So some of them belonged to the intervention group that were the ones that actually implemented upright in their schools. And the other schools did not implement upright and they contributed in the evaluation. So we could compare the, the results from the schools that received the intervention with the results from the schools that did not receive the intervention. The intervention was implemented two times in each school during three years. And as I told you before, uh, we used mixed methods. We did um, interviews to measure uh, the acceptability and satisfaction with the intervention. And we use also questionnaires to measure the effect of the intervention in, in, the, in psychological terms. So now we we would like to present to you the upright framework. This is the content that uh, that teachers, families and students will learn uh, during the program. Specifically, there are four competencies that are promoted through the training of 18 skills and we will provide a description for each of these components. We start with the component of social and emotional learning. This competence aims to increase personal knowledge and improve the quality of social relations. And this objective is working on through the acquisition and training of five key skills like self-awareness, self-management, relationship skills and responsible decision making. This, the second uh, resilience competence is efficacy. It aims to increase the confidence in our personal abilities to achieve goals and overcome difficulties. And this competence is worked on through the acquisition and training of five other skills, which are self-efficacy, growth mindset, emotional resilience, social resilience and leadership. The third resilience competence is coping. It aims to train in effective problem solving. To this end, four skills are worked on like cognitive behavior modification, conflict resolution, assertiveness and communication strategies, and mental health literacy. And the last competence is mindfulness. The aim of mindfulness, as you know, is to improve our ability to direct the focus of our attention. So in mindfulness, we train four skills, observation, description, act, with, act consciously, and accept without judging. 
So in this slide, you can see the complete resilience framework that is composed by the four resilience competencies and the 18 skills. So the way to transfer this large content to students, families and teachers is through two different programs. The program Wellbeing for Us has an individual approach to, pro to promote personal resilience and the program Wellbeing for All has a collective approach to promote social resilience. The, well the Wellbeing for Us program aims for all upright participants to learn and train in their 18 skills. The program runs throughout the school year. Firstly, it is the teachers themselves who are trained in the resilience program so that they experience firsthand the benefits of, acquire, of acquiring these resilience skills. Once trained, it is the teachers who are in charge of training the students, leading the training in the 18 skills in the classroom, in groups and during school hours. And fun, finally, families are also training upright through an online platform from which they have access to all the contents of the program. And the second program is called Wellbeing for All, and it aims to promote a culture of mental well-being at the school through collective and open activities at the school level. In this way, the theoretical content, sorry, of the upright program is out of the classroom and extends to the whole school families and pupils of all grades. Thus, the environment surrounding the adolescents is also training resilience skills and becomes a source of social resilience in case of adversity. So that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. And I now give the floor to Mete to continue presenting Upright. Thank you. Thank you, Coletta. Um, will you remove your presentation yeah. yes and i will open mine while we while we were for a uh, the presentation. Thank you very much, Carlotta. I see a lot of positive comments in the chat, which is great. And yes, now we can see the presentation. So the floor is yours, Matt Marie. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm just here to 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 tell you more about the materials that we uh, provided for the Upright program. As Carlotta told you, you can see the Wellbeing for Us program. That's for year one for intervention directly in class. And for the second year, we have the Wellbeing for All program, which is uh, intervention meant for embedding the upright uh, skills and components uh, into the school culture. When we decided to, to create this manual, we had some serious considerations. So we decided to, to use evidence-based exercises which have already proved effective, but we have also been using exercises made by uh, professionals and educators within the field. And we have also within the Upright Partners in the Upright Consortium, we have also been constructing exercises. Um, what was very important to us, as well as um, what we have learned from the co-creation phase was that we needed to have a great ver variety of methods within the upright program. So for the theory section of, of the manual we created, we had an information sector explaining the theory. We have created upright videos. I will show them uh, um, later with small animated videos. We have created upright PowerPoint slides for the teacher to use directly in class when explaining stuff to the students. We have also created mindfulness audios um, for the teacher to use if they do not want themselves to read aloud and to, to, to be the, the presenters of the mindfulness exercises. And also we created links and QR codes for small videos or video clips explaining the skills and competences. But also very, very important is the practice part of the program. 
the, the, the student told us in the co-creation phase that it was very needed, that they, they were engaged, they were active, they were involved. So we created different types of um, activities and, and exercises. We have food for thoughts. We have group discussion, dilemmas and role playing. We use stories and photos and videos. They have a, a designated upright notebook for writing exercises, creative writing and reflections. They use small group exercises and brainstorming exercises. And finally, very important, they do transfer exercises. What is learned in the classroom is not staying inside the classroom, but it's transfer to real life as well. So this is an example of the Wellbeing for Us program. We have the theoretical points. We have student exercises, mindfulness audios, small animated videos, and the IT platform which is both accessible for teachers as well as parents. And I will introduce a few examples of the theory in the manual. For the mindfulness section you see here, it, this is an example of uh, uh, the, the theory presented with small um, quotes, with uh, opening questions, with the QR codes, explaining the links, and also uh, everyday example of why is this skill important. This is an example of one of the, co the coping component. We have a skill called cognitive behavior modification. And this is an example of a presentation of this skill. We have a mastery component. And this is the growth mindset skill, which is presented theoretical in, as, with this as an example. And finally, we have the social emotional learning component. And this is social awareness skill and how we present this theoretically. There are also examples of exercises in the manual. And what is important is that if you have a look at, at the page where you can see the yellow frames, the first yellow frame always explain the objectives of an exercise, the time needed to do the exercise, and what kind of materials. The white, the white section of the exercises is, is for instructions for the students, and then finally, the, the, the last yellow part is further suggestion. How do you debrief the exercise within the classroom? And on the left side, you can see different examples of QR code, codes and links to videos um, elaborating on these different skills. This is an example of a coping exercise. There's always a short story explaining the skills and exercises to, to be done, done in class. And this is an example of the mastery component. Um, and finally, a, an exercise for the social emotional learning. This is about social awareness. How do we read and understand each other's uh, facial mimics and body language, but also to consider that sometimes we do not use ourselves as persons, but we use um, emojis to send by phone and, and, and how are they, these translated? Do we actually mean the same when we are sending off the emojis? This is an example where you can see the objective. This is an example for social resilience. We have this balloon exercise. The objective is to improve social resilience, getting better as working as a team. The exercise is estimated to 10, 15 minutes and a debriefing of five minutes. The materials needed is three to five balloons. And the instruction is that you form a large circle. And then the, the students are told uh, that it, uh, to work as a team and prevent the balloons from hitting the floor in, in cooperation. And the further suggestion is that they can, they can try the, the same exercise, but on a, uh, on a different level. They hold hands. Or you can actually. Uh, debate in class, how can this exercise be, be used to promote social resilience within the class? So for the well-being for all uh, phase, we created another manual. This is based on the, same, the, the framework that we've been using for the well-being for us. It's about boosting well-being resilience, but it's also about embe embedding it in the entire school the school culture, and that means that the second year is non-component dependent. This is also examples from the manual. You can see we've created it in the same manner. 
we have created an, an example for the teachers or for the schools to see how can you actually implement a well-being for all plan. We have also added photos from the first year with examples from teachers and classes who have been doing some of the activities um, as, in, as inspiration for further classes. And I've brought um, two small exercises with me today. Uh, I'm not sure we have the time for both of them, but let's give it a go and see how far we can get. This is an exercise from the coping component on conflict resolution. At first, we present different strategies for solving co conflicts. Avoidance. If you solve a, a, a conflict by avoiding it, it means that you're withdrawing from the con conflict. That means that you're giving up the goal and it takes a toll on the relationship. Another strategy is dominance. You can enforce your will towards the other party. That means that you achieve the goal, but it also takes a toll on the relationship. Then there's a strategy called sub subjection. It means that you adapt. It means that you abandon the goal in order to maintain the relationship. And we have highlighted here in blue the collaboration because this is a win-win situation. Is it possible to create a solution where you achieve the goal and you maintain the relationship? And finally, one of the strategies is compromise. It means that both sides give up some demands to meet in the middle. You give up a part of it, but you maintain the relationship. So this was a very, very quick tour. And now it's your turn because we have to consider some of the uh, conflicts that we meet. So the first kind of conflict could be among students. The second one could be among students and teachers. The third is about the entire class and the teacher. The fourth is parents and teachers. And finally, we have students and parents. So what we ask you to do is to do a very quick reflection of what type of conflict that you most often encounter. Then you click on the link to the Padlet. I'll show the Padlet in just a second and go back to this side. So you can just wait a second with clicking on the link, but it, that, will, that will lead you to a Padlet. And what you do here is you write a, a, a short um, sentence about what kind of conflicts do you often meet in, in, in your profession. And you can mark this conflict with what kind of strategies do you most often see when they're trying to solve the, the, this, this uh, conflict? So I'll just show the, the Padlet very quickly. You have the student conflict among the student, and you have all these categories with, with um, possible conflicts. What you do is you click on the plus, and then you just write your reflection. And to the far right, you can see these different st strategies about avoidance or dominance or a collaboration. So I will return to the link and I think it will be possible for you just to click on the link and then it will open in um, open and you can write a few sentences. Yes, exactly. Otherwise you can find the link in the chat. My colleague Eleonora just posted it. So you can either try to click on it or just find it in the chat. Meantime, I would like to remind you all that in case you have questions, you can post them in the chat. And at the end, we will have 10 minutes for the for the Q&A session. So please feel free to, to post them in the chat. Thank you very much. And if you have a look at the, the Padlet, meanwhile, you can see that there's already a lot of comments about what kind of conflicts do you most often see. And I can see that a lot of you have uh, comments about student conflict or student teacher conflict. If uh, I can see that only a few of you are writing the, the strategies for the 
uh, conflict resolution, but try to reflect for a second about what kind of uh, strategies do you most, most often see? Okay, I'll just give you a minute and then we'll move on to the next exercise. Okay, well, let's continue. This was a, just an example of, of um, an exercise from the Wellbeing for Us program. Um, the aim is to, um, to, to teach the students um, uh, that some of the strategies are, uh, are possible to create a win-win situation for all par parties in a conflict, and, and that will be the preferable strategies to use. I have also brought with me today a well-being for all exercise, and we're going to use a Padlet as well. And what is very important to, to state today is that when we created all the exercises and the activities for, for, for the Upright program, we intended for all exercises to be classroom exercises or exercises in real world. And then the COVID-19 situation came and we had to adapt the exercises uh, to online platform as well. So what you see here today and what we do today is actually adapted exercises. That's, um, that's important to stress as well. But this exercise is um, a uh, well-being for all exercise. It's a gratitude uh, note. So what you do is you reflect upon a person who has been, who has been or done something you feel grateful about. You can click on the link for the Padlet and then you can um, you can press on the, the, the plus in the right corner and you can write a short gratitude note. So you can click on the link and I will just, um, I'll just state, I have uh, uh, just put one down here from one of the students saying, Dear X, you've been here for me during this difficult time. You've really helped me get through this. Thank you so much for being here. I miss you and I hope to see you soon. Kind regards, Y. So a few minutes for you to write your gratitude note as well. So if you click on the link, it should be possible to access the pattern as well. I can see a few gratitude notes is already stated on the Padlet. And I'll just read a few of them aloud. Thank you. Thank you for make. Oh, they are jumping right at the same time here. Dear difficult student, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being yourself in my class and for showing me that we can both work together to solve our problems, whether they're only about our lessons or from outside the school. Thank you for making me improving my relationship skills. Thank you for support and make, oh, they are jumping right at the same time here. Dear difficult student, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being yourself in my class and for showing me that we can both work together to solve our problems, whether they're only about our lessons or from outside the school. Thank you for making me improving my relationship skills. Thank you for support and thank you for me oh they are jumping right <laughs> at the same time here dear difficult student thank you from the bottom of my heart for being yourself in my class and for showing me that we can both work together to solve our problems whether they're only about our lessons or from 
outside. We can see a, a rise in well-being and, and actually also in happiness for weeks after delivering an, a gratitude net note. So you might try it out and see if your gratitude note will increase your well-being as well as it will the to the one that you intended if you dare reading it aloud or sending it to him or her. Thank you very much for, for uh, con contributing to the exercises. I will just uh, finish off by reminding you that all these beautiful materials, we have the online platform for teachers, for parents. We have the, the theory part, we, the exercises, the mindfulness audios, all the small animated videos. You can see an image from um, a, a female student balancing uh, the resilient skills. You can see uh, ex examples of posters and digital messages. And what is important to state as well right now is um, that the manual exists right now in Basque, in Spanish, in English, in Polish, in Danish, in Italian, and in, in Icelandic languages. And this materials will be free from January 2022. That's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we see a lot of positive comments in the chat, which is great. Uh, and for thank you for presenting the Upright project. It was really informative and I'm sure it will be useful for the for the participants. But now if you have time, it would be great to have 10 minutes for the for the questions uh, and and the answers. So if you agree, I'm going to read out loud some of the questions that we received and then you can uh, decide who who picks up what. OK, among among you, of course. So uh, I will try to combine some questions that we received. Um, the first one was how can we improve well, first of all, would you say that resilience is the key to success in learning? And how can we improve the resilience of students and teachers in school settings by utilizing telecommunication due to COVID? So more related to the to the recent period, I would say that we we all had to face a lot of challenges and um, participants are more interested uh, in um, in the in this period in, in with this question. Yeah, I would like to give an example from from the Danish pilot side, because um, we had uh, for the well-being for all um, the, the final year, we had just one school who was able to do all the activities as face to face activities in the classroom or in real life as it intended. But we had two schools who were in lockdown and we needed to do the, the exercises as, as um, and activities as online sessions. And um, we had these gratitude letters, but we also did some cyber praising events that the student were praising each other on, on in, in the cyber. And, and the, what the student said, it was, it was really doing something to their well-being that they had to consider these questions to write a gratitude letter and finding out that they had something to be grateful for even though the situation was tough and and they told us also that when they do did the cyber praising event then somebody was thinking of them and that made them feel better and feel more or less happy uh, and i think that you can do all these small kinds of, of exercises and activities to boost well-being and resilience, even in times like COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much for replying. And uh, another participant asked, will uh, these techniques, strategies work as well among students between 15 19? Um, can you give some maybe advices or if you have a um, any opinion on that um, about students aged 15 and 19? Mm. <clears throat> yes, regarding the age of the group, we have tested the program in adolescents between 12 and 14. 
and uh, we can say uh, that uh, the program, uh, well, it is being evaluated, but it was made for this age range and we expect it to work in this age range. What the literature says is that the better we start, um, the, the, the better it is uh, to learn these abilities. So it is good to start as early as possible and maybe um, even before the age of 12, and the effort is just to, that we have to make is just to adapt the complexity of the language to the, to the level of understanding of, of students that are uh, 10 years old, for instance. So once this is said, that the earlier the better, it, when, when we are thinking of intervening in adolescents between uh, 15 and 19, it is also a great opportunity. They have um, they have mu much developed capa uh, cognitive capacities, so they will probably take um, a good uh, use of the of the manual. And we cannot uh, tell you scientifically how it will work because we, as as I said, we have only tested in in 12 to 19. But it could be we we at least from my part. Just, this is just a personal opinion because it is not scientifically tested, but from my personal opinion, I think that students would benefit from the program uh, because this is still very relevant for them. What do you think, Mete? I think it's important to say that we have used the same activities and exercises when we did the teacher training and we did as well with the parents training. So it, they have actually been doing the same program, but of course they are doing some, some, some different reflections. So I think it will be very easy to adapt to older students, but it will need more work to adapt to younger students. And the participants would like to know more in general um, if the project materials will be available also in other languages than the ones of the project? So far the, the, the project is available in seven languages and uh, by the end of uh, by January it will still be available in seven languages and we might in the future develop other languages but not by January 2022. Okay, thank you very much for the for the information. But this is already, I mean, really good to have it available in several languages, and uh, we hope for the future <laughs> that it's going to be available in more languages. And one last question, maybe for you: um, In your research, did you discover if there are countries that are already rolling out good well-being programs in their schools? I met it. I give you the floor. Yeah, could you just rephrase the, the, the question? I didn't get it. Yes, if um, they, they were asking in, if in your research, did you discover if there are countries that are already already rolling out good well-being programs in their schools? Yes, we actually did a review of a lot of both resilience and well-being programs. And, and there are absolutely beautiful programs out there, but the, the, the problem sometimes is that it might not be research-based. And it means that, that we don't know the, uh, um, the, the range of the effects. So, so it, it, it might be a very good program and it might be um, just doing a little bit uh, for, for some students. So, so what we were trying in the Upright program was to gather all this knowledge and the exercises and activities from, from some of the best programs or best um, uh, materials um, and then to make the scientific approach. We would like to see if it actually made a difference. So, so I think that's important when you consider all learning materials from students. Is it something that you just feel is, is it seems to be quite good or do you know for sure that, that it has been tested and, and somebody actually tried it out and, and, and find it was effectful? I think that that's very important to consider. 
Thank you, thank you, Matt Marie, and thank you, thank you, Carlotta. Um, I think if there are no no more questions, I don't see other questions in the chat. So I think we covered all the ones that were posted. And just an information for the participants. Uh, the certificate, no certificates will be issued after the webinar. And please remember to, um, to complete the feedback form that my colleague Eleonora will post in the chat in a moment. Make sure to save the link so uh, when we close this webinar, you will be able to, 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 fill, to fill it in afterwards. And thank you, thank you very much again, Carlotta and Matt Paris. If you would like to say something to close it, uh, the floor is yours, of course. And from our side, really, thanks a lot for uh, for the for the presentation. As I said, I'm sure it was really inspiring, and it will be really useful for for the people that attended the webinar. And please, if you want to say something, uh, uh, feel more than free to do it now. I would like to say something then. I would like to say something to all the teachers out there. I know that, that the academic content is always important in schools and you are measured and tested and whatsoever. But the social emotional skills, the skills of well-being and resilience, they are the foundation for success in academic as well. So please don't forget them. Yes, and uh, I would like to also um, say, say thank you to all the teachers and the schools that have uh, contributed uh, to the research project in this time, uh, because we know that it's really difficult to implement a program like this and even more during COVID times. And uh, we believe that um, it's more than timely to implement this type of programs, despite they take a, a big effort. I think it is the time to, to, to implement them and work on resilience and well-being for the time being and for the future. And just that the program will be available for free and, and we expect you to visit the web page and just leave you, your comments and questions about the program and any issues you may have, we will try to sort them out. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, we encourage the participants also to visit uh, the website and uh, uh, to know more about the program. And thank you very much again uh, for being uh, with us today. It was uh, it was really, really nice to have you here. So thank you for accepting our invitation. And I'm sure we can stay in contact and in case the participants have other questions, they, they can always contact you and we will share the, the materials and the presentation and the recording. It will be available afterwards. So they will have all the materials and all the information available at any time. So thank you very much and I wish you all a good evening. I will stop the recording now. Afterwards. So they will have all the materials and all the information available at any time. So thank you very much and I wish you all a 